lot for you guys too. How's this? Yeah. Yeah. Right, great, thank you. Uh, I want to start with like a really brief catch up. There was an incident in 2021. Um, maybe some of you guys heard of it. It's called Colonial Pipeline. There's a ransomware attack. Um, you guys have heard. That's right. Uh, that prompted a series of regulations. Can you give us a very quick? Can you give us a very quick overview of the regulations that you have uh, kind of overseen in those two years since then? Sure. Sure. So, um, as you mentioned, May 2021, early May, uh, ransomware attack. Um, East Coast Pipeline had systemic impact across the East Coast. Uh, what we did in working with our partners in CISA uh, was immediately put out a requirement that any owner and operator of critical infrastructure had to report um, any significant cyber incident because when this one occurred, the company asked, hey, how many other pipelines have suffered this kind of attack? And we didn't have that answer. Um, so we put that regulation out first. That came out uh, in the very same month in May. Um, but interestingly, uh, and I think really importantly for our talk this, this afternoon is that reporting went to CISA, not to TSA intentionally um, because we're trying to centralize reporting. We're trying to make it easier on the owners and operators of critical infrastructure in the country. And you can imagine if you have a reporting requirement to several different federal agencies, um, every agency is going to hear it a little bit differently. Um, and so there, that, that introduces an element potentially of confusion. So having a report go in at the same time one central location, and then having uh, CISA push it out to all of the affected agencies has really been, in my view, a best practice. Um, the other thing that we didn't know at the time, but um, certainly now uh, is part of the national cyber strategy, is to harmonize uh, reporting requirements across the federal government. And this was really the very first uh, attempt to do that. And I, I would credit um, CISA for doing just a fabulous job of giving us, uh, in near real time, ports of those incidents, and it's really, I think, worked out incredibly well. I mean, I have more questions, but if you have a follow on that. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we've done several kind of pre-briefing chats, and these two are so chummy. Sorry. No, 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 it's, it's you know, government working. Um, I want to ask you, like, really point blank, that was such a high profile, the most high profile, I work in news, I can say that definitively, the most high profile ransomware incident ever. Uh, and there has not been anything like it in any of the jurisdictions of the CSA. Um, is that why? These regulations is, and, and the partnership with, with CISA, is that why? Uh, I would love to be able to claim that. I can't. Um, but well, you know, one of the things that we did do as well, I mean, that was the reporting requirement. Uh, what was important that we did right after that in July was issue some requirements for the owners of critical pipeline infrastructure. So that's important. It wasn't all pipeline infrastructure, it was critical pipeline infrastructure. Um, to uh, Im implement certain measures to protect their systems from a future attack, not necessarily ransomware, but a future attack on their information or operating systems. Um, as many of you might remember, when we did issue that directive, because it was so specific as to what was required, um, we got a, a good deal of pushback on that because the industry w would say that, um, hey, you know, you're asking us to put things in place that are going to replace things we're already doing that actually we think it's to the point you want to get to better than what you're requiring. Um, and you haven't fully considered the impact on our business model. Uh, and so what we did in working with CISA and the FBI and um, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Agency over in DOT and the Department of Energy was we had a series of roundtables with industry just to talk through this. Um, net result was we went from a very prescriptive activities-based requirement to a performance-based model, which uh, I think is far superior to what we were doing before. And, and a huge credit to our industry partners um, for working with us on that. Um, so we made really a 180-degree pivot on our approach to this particular regulation and uh, I think that's a forebearer of change we'll make to regulations in the future for TSA. So instead of saying, hey, achieve these certain activities and report on those activities, we said, hey, there are certain outcomes we want you to achieve. You come back to us, owner operator, and um, tell us how you intend to achieve that outcome. And then we'll work with you to approve that implementation plan. Uh, and then the follow on to that is, uh, and this is really important, this is where the stage we're at today, is come back to us also after your implementation plan is approved and tell us objectively 
how you are achieving those outcomes. Um, so it's not just tell us how you're doing and implementing those particular measures that you proposed and we approved, but also how are those measures and the accomplishment of those measures uh, contributing to the achievement of the outcome. That's really important. That's the stage uh, that we're at today. And, and uh, I'm really optimistic on how this is going to work because we've already seen some of the original uh, initial plans and they look uh, pretty good. So uh, we're going to be working through that over the course of the next couple of weeks. The U.S. did not have any kind of cyber regulation like this kind of infamously for years up until this point. Um, this is America. A lot of businesses don't care for, care for uh, you know, government regulation. Um, is it the case when you speak with the leaders of these companies, are they completely on board? Are there some that would like more regulation? Are there some that would like things to be done a little differently? Well, um, you, you raised an important point, Kevin, is uh, when you speak. And, and um, I would, I would um, offer that we speak frequently um, to our um, industry partners, um, to the companies that we regulate. Um, I, would, I would say that there's a more robust exchange of information as a result of this approach than there was before. Um, one of the things that we did at the very beginning when uh, we saw this threat um, that is not simply a ransomware threat, it's, it's much more significant than that, um, that we needed to work really quickly um, to close vulnerabilities that we had across our critical infrastructure in the country. And, and so um, we, we felt it was important that we bring the um, chief executive officers of those companies in for a, a classified briefing on the threat because we really wanted them to understand hey, this is the threat that we see from um, the intelligence community in the United States, which is uh, incredible in, in their capability to inform uh, policy decision makers like Jen and me. Um, and so we, we brought the CEOs in for those threat briefs. They were in, in the White House. Um, it was uh, really the start of a very good relationship because they saw what we were seeing and the CEOs knew that um, their CIO and their CISA was going to come to them shortly with a resource request, maybe some procedural changes, um, certainly a request for more people. And the CEOs knew what, what, what was behind that, what was the reasoning for that. Um, but you can't just do it once. It's, it's, this can't be a one and done um, uh, exchange of information. And so what we've established, and, and Jen can speak to the, the processes that, that parallel ours but are very complementary um, to what we do um, in terms of making sure there's good, robust exchanges of information um, between us. But we have regular updates to the CEOs and then regular updates to the CIOs and the CISOs these companies as this threat evolves and and you know one of the things that you always think about is hey I heard the threat I understand it I see it is it still present today um, and this just reaffirms to them yes it's still present today actually in many ways it's more concerning today than it was yesterday and so we need to really work very hard um, to close the vulnerabilities that we might have yeah I mean I jump in with a couple of things first of all you know um, great to be here with you all um, Kevin mentioned that Dave and I are chummy um, Look, at the end of the day, this is what you're, you want uh, your government to be. You want your government to be collaborative and cohesive. And so I think it's a really good news story and one that has evolved in terms of how collaborative we all are working together. And I think it was a really good news story of how closely our teams work after Colonial Pipeline. I was not actually in government then. I was still at Morgan Stanley at that point in time, but certainly saw it from the perspective of being in the private sector and frankly being in a highly regulated industry. Um, a couple of things I'll say is, you know, it really was a watershed moment in many ways. It certainly led to the security directives that Dave talked about. But I don't think we would have gotten uh, the, what's called CERCIA, the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act, if Colonial Pipeline had not happened. And it really is a watershed piece of legislation that, frankly, the Congress had been trying to pass for more than a decade. That was about mandating critical infrastructure report to CISA if there was a significant cyber incident. And we're in the final stages of writing the rule. It, uh, the notice of uh, rulemaking should come out early next year and will hopefully implement it by next year. But it's really, really important. Why? Because you know, you read so much about ransomware going up, ransomware going down. My general belief is we just don't know. 
you know, we just don't have a really good handle on the scope and scale of the ecosystem of cyber incidents because frankly it's not mandatory uh, for reporting across the board. So I think for the first time we'll actually be able to understand what the scope is of incidents and whether all the work that we've been doing across the federal government, across industry, across state and local, across the globe is actually leading to reduced risk because at the end of the day that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to create um, punishments, we're really trying to work with industry in a collaborative, consultative way to ensure that we can help them reduce risk. And you know, the last thing I'd say to, to Kevin's question is, when I first came on board, which was in July, we did actually hear a lot of pushback from the industry groups about one of the directives. And I will tell you, we recently, Dave and I had a meeting with CEOs where they could not have been more complimentary about the evolution of working with them in a consultative way. I think part of that was the threat briefing, but part of that was just frickin' listening. And, and that's why you see people like me and Dave, because we realize how important it is to listen, to listen to industry, to listen to the hacker community, because we sure can't do this on our own. Uh, I want to be clear here, when you talk about this threat briefing, are we talking, this was, this was Related to Colonial, or are we talking more recent with China? Um, no, we, we've done threat briefing, certainly for pipelines. It wasn't related to um, the ransomware attack specifically. It was related to, um, hey, what is the overall threat picture for critical infrastructure, particularly um, for transportation infrastructure and energy infrastructure in the country? Um, same brief, essentially, uh, very, very similar to the rail um, sector, um, the transit sector, and now to uh, air carriers and airports. So, you know, across the transportation sector, we've been able to provide this level of visibility to the uh, the, the top owners and operators of these systems. Um, and in your, you know, you've got this. What seems like what you're saying is a, is extremely effective partnership that works for you. Uh, what other sectors would you like to have that kind of? If you know, if the red tape was not as much of an issue, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking. I'm reporting all the time on ransomware attacks on hospitals or diverting ambulances that are, you know, hampering care. There's schools that are still being shut down all the time. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we did um, last year when we were thinking about what are our priorities for the upcoming year was what are those sectors we called target rich, cyber poor? Um, to Kevin's point, who are getting hit with ransomware in a way, in a pretty bad way that could actually have very significant impacts so my mom is 90 and she's in and out of the hospital, right? And I am always very, very concerned as I have in the back of my mind all of these hospitals that have been hit with ransomware. You saw the recent one, uh, Prospect Medical Hospitals, I think, or Medical Holdings, where we've seen hospitals across the country that had to divert patients or, or change elective surgeries. It's really scary. And so we actually picked priority sectors that we knew fell into this. So hospitals, in particular rural hospitals, K through 12 schools, uh, and water facilities, because that's a sector that I'm particularly concerned about. And then we also have a big focus over this year going into next on local election offices. And we did it for a couple reasons. So one of the roles, we, we of course were set up to be America's civilian cyber defense agency, but in statute, we also play this role of national coordinator for critical infrastructure security and resilience. What does that mean? It means that we sort of sit at the center of working with departments and agencies that have a role to be the sector risk management agency. So Dave is the sector, TSA is the sector risk management agency for oil and natural gas pipelines, for rail, for aviation. And we work with him and all of the other departments and agencies to ensure that sector risk management agencies and industry have the risk guidance, the information, uh, the resources, the capabilities, the best practices that we all need to be able to reduce risk, critical infrastructure that Americans rely on every hour uh, of every day. So a really, really important role uh, that we play. And with respect to the target rich resource poor, it's why we've been working hand in hand with HHS. So my deputy, Nitin Natarajan, who's fantastic, started out as a, as a medic and spent a lot of time in HHS. So he's been working hand in hand with HHS and the American Hospital Association, 
to put resources in place to reduce risk in hospitals. We've been working with K through 12. There was a big White House event earlier this week where we had Interrupted by superintendents. A tornado. Say again. Interrupted by a tornado. Interrupted by a tornado, but like amazing that we were able to actually flip it a day. And it was so important to the first lady that she actually rearranged her whole schedule to be there. We had all these superintendents so that we could work together with schools. We're doing the same thing with water and then again, local election offices. And so, you know, part of this just goes back to the partnership. CISA has incredible technical expertise. We've got a lot of it here, so hopefully you're meeting our CISA colleagues. But those departments and agencies have incredible technical expertise in those sectors that we don't have about rail, about aviation, about hospitals, about water. And so when you bring that together along with our partnerships with industry, you really can uh, collaborate to reduce risk. Do you feel like you have enough in terms of policy allowance to address those specific sectors or would you like more? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm always grateful to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission folks and Dave was on there as well. So some of you might know it was a commission uh, set up by Congress several years ago. Uh, it was chaired by Angus King of Maine and Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin. It had senior leaders from across the federal government. You know, I often say, so the government sets up commissions all the time and some of them like meet a lot and don't really get much done. In my 30 plus years in government, I've seen two commissions that actually got shit done. One was the 9-11 commission. The second was the Cyberspace Solarium Commission that literally made 75 recommendations and more than half of them are in legislation. And CISA benefited incredibly from those recommendations that got put into law in 2021 and I benefited when I came in as director. And so some of the things that we would have wanted, frankly, several years ago that my great friend Chris Krebs may have wanted, you know, the ability to hunt persistently on federal networks, the ability uh, to work directly with our sector risk management agencies to actually put measures in place to keep sectors safe, uh, the authorities we have to stand up the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. I feel like we're in, and then Circea, of course, I feel like we're in a very positive place with respect to our authorities. You know, I often get asked, well, do you want regulatory authorities? And I always say no. CISA doesn't want to be a regulator. We work very closely with regulators, but at the end of the day, the magic of CISA is our ability through our technical expertise and our trusted partnerships to be able to work across industry in a way that, you know, frankly, is a little bit harder um, with regulators. So, so I think we're cool. Okay. Um, I don't know, probably most of you can't see this, but Jen's arm, she has what appears to be a, a temporary tattoo, or is this is, is this a full a full thing? Okay, multiple. Well, this one's real, and these are temporary. But if since you brought it up, here's a funny story. So we are recruiting for technical experts, right? And I was like, I'm so into it because we've hired like 1,330 people since I came on board. I'm in a tattoo. They are temporary. I would do it if I if somebody had time. So 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 my guys like we made these temporary tattoos. And they put it on, like, yeah, let's, let's go for it. And, like, it just doesn't work. It was like this morning, let's do another one, and it doesn't work. So we have the QR code separately. My whole body's going to be tattooed with these temporary <laughs> tattoos. So. But we, we're hiring. We're hiring people. So come see us. We have real QR codes that work, not on my body. This really was, this was my lead-in to let you guys kind of make the pitch for, I think, a substantial reason why you guys are here, but also... I've been coming to DEF CON for almost 10 years. There are a lot more federal officials giving talks these days, and it's for a reason, I think. Well, I, you know, I, I would say the, the key reason is you have uh, in, in the audience uh, expertise that we desperately need. You have perspective that we desperately need. I mean, you heard about the work that we're doing. Um, we, I would want to make sure that the work we do is based on the very best information that we can gather. Um, and so we're here to really um, seek uh, your advice, your counsel. We have some mechanisms um, to be able to do that. And then the other one is just clearly, like, like Jen said, we're here um, because we're hiring. Uh, you know, we need talent. And um, I think I can tell you from my own experience working in the federal government, I'm, I'm six years into uh, being the TSA administrator. Um, uh, the, the work we do together with CISA, with the FBI, with the Department of Transportation, um, the White House, 
is incredibly rewarding. I mean, you, you have impact at a scale that um, is, is just challenging at times, but, but the benefits are, are incredibly rewarding. And we had a great booth here at, uh, at DEF CON, uh, offered up um, a lot of um, uh, decals, offered up a lot of um, ways to uh, approach TSA uh, for positions. But if you're interested, please give it consideration. And I think too that you know, in, in my career, you know, the, the ability to build a network is really important for your success throughout your career. Um, and if you come into government, you build a network inside government. Uh, when you return to the private sector, if you do, you continue to keep that relationships and that network you have uh, in the private sector very warm. And I think that really helps the entire system uh, work uh, incredibly well. So um, that's what we'd really like to, um, to encourage you to do is if you know somebody who has, has talent that you think we could benefit by, uh, please encourage them to, to look up CISA, look up TSA, um, look up any sector risk management agency, quite frankly, because we all need um, the talent. Um, we also announced um, earlier uh, in this conference a, a project that um, Jen and I have together. It's called Chariot. And so, um, you know, we've, we, we, we wrestled with the acronym, um, but we felt, okay, Chariot is a transportation thing, right? And, and this is a, a transportation project. And uh, we are at Caesars, so um, uh, the Chariot and Caesars sort of go together. Um, but what Chariot stands for is uh, critical in, uh, uh, infrastructure hardening achieved through risk reduction in information and operational technology. Um, yeah. Way to go. It's, thanks. Um, I've been practicing a lot. Um, but, um, uh, but basically what it stands for, it's a partnership between um, uh, TSA, between CISA, um, between the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate, um, between um, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration and the Federal Railway Administration, uh, and also the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And what we'd like to do is to, um, to get um, more industry input and your input on, uh, hey, if you looked at the rail sector or the pipeline sector, how would you prioritize the risk as a hacker um, to those sectors? Um, and then the important, uh, the other important part is I mentioned, hey, we need to have an objective way to assure ourselves and to assure the public what we're doing is having an, an, a beneficial effect. What we're doing is making these systems more protected um, and making these systems more resilient. So if attacked, uh, even partially, they can get up and running in a relatively quick fashion. Um, and so what we'd like to, to develop are um, threat scenarios that then we can introduce into tabletop exercises. Because as you know better than I, um, a cyber attack will manifest itself in a physical way. And, uh, and that requires a different response than, than a purely cyber response to get back uh, up and operating. And so if you could really help us with giving us sort of a risk prioritization um, and also helping us develop um, those, risk, those, those threat scenarios so we can play out those threat scenarios. And we promise that uh, what we will do in a future DEF CON uh, is to provide you feedback as to, as to how that went. And I'm hoping that uh, when I come back next year, um, and I'll declare myself a new guy again next year so I can do the, do the shots. It's um, not really my first. <laughs> <laughs> I know, nor Jen's. Um, um, but you know, to give you some feedback as to, hey, how did that go? What did we develop out of it? We had an uh, initial roundtable um, uh, yesterday on this, got some really good results. So I just ask you to think of Project Chariot. It's, it's really a way for uh, you to really help us out and to help the country out and help everybody that lives in the United States to make them feel uh, more protected. And Jen's point about the, um, the hospital system, um, to make sure that the critical infrastructure that all of us depend on for ourselves and for our families and for our friends and our communities is, uh, is back on its feet as quickly as it can if it's ever attacked. Just a, a couple of things about um, why we're here. Obviously, recruiting is one, but one of the really cool things that we've been focused on over the last year is creating a partnership with the hacker community to help us get ahead of the ransomware problem, right? This was also um, part of what we learned from Colonial Pipeline, uh, is we really need to be able to rely on partners who are seeing uh, malware before it actually gets activated. And so there's some fantastic researchers out there, there's threat intel people, there's some industry folks who have been given our t giving our team in the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative essentially tips. Um, and so it's part of what we call our pre-ransomware notification 
initiative. And so we've been getting tips. We take those tips. Um, when malware is laid down, it could be you know anywhere between five to 48 hours before it's actually activated and data is encrypted. And so we then use our field force. So one of the other things we've been building over the past two years are cybersecurity advisors across the country. So we have them in uh, every state of the nation, I think, at this point in time. And they then take these tips and then they've been reaching out to let people know, hey, it looks like you have something on your system. You need to do something about it right away. And we've done it now 600 plus times to schools, to uh, also internationally. And we've really been able to make an impact. And again, the thing that I love most about this is is it's all based on trust. I mean, that's the most important currency is people reach out to us because they trust us with the information and they believe we're going to do things about it. So going to do something good with it. And so again, that's really what this community is all about is how do we use our skills to make a difference, to make an impact for the betterment of the nation. Speaking of that, you know, you've got, you've got a four-year term. I won't ask you to speculate right now on whether they'll, they'll keep going, but um, if you want to, you can. Sure. <laughs> what would you like to see the ransomware defense landscape look like five years from now? Well, I mean, <laughs> no more ransomware. Um, so look, I, I, I appreciate you asking the question because I, I have long thought that we cannot keep doing the same thing that we're doing and expect a different outcome. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons we, my, my teammate Eric Goldstein, who heads up cyber for CISA, and I wrote this article earlier this year, which is really trying to get at what is a more sustainable approach to cybersecurity, one that can actually make a difference. And we talked about sort of four things. One is this concept of cyber civil defense. One is our persistent operational collaboration. Uh, one is uh, corporate cyber responsibility, but the one that we think can make the most difference in driving down the threat uh, impact is secure by design technology. You know, we, we now live in a crazy world where we've normalized the fact that technology products come off the line full of vulnerabilities that can be exploited by threat actors. And so you, we've accepted this, and it's frankly perverse. And we really need to change the paradigm where technology companies are not just focused on speed to market and cost and cool features, but first and foremost on creating tech that is safe and secure. I mean, let's be real, right? There's a multi-billion dollar cybersecurity industry because technology companies have never had to focus first and foremost on security. The incentives were all misaligned. And so we've re we're really trying to work with our partners across the government. We did a workshop earlier today with our teammates at the National Cyber Director's Office to really catalyze what I call a secure by design revolution. And I would ask everybody, if you haven't seen the stuff that we put out, we put out a white paper, it's on our web page, Page, please go to cisa.gov forward slash secure by design and take a look at that because you know we want feedback. We want to refine this. We want to bring in more partners because at the end of the day, we want to ensure that we now have a market signal coming from customers that we all care about security for our for our persons, for our, for our personal, for our family, for our communities, for our businesses. And I think, frankly, Kevin, if we're going to have a real dent in the ransomware system, we need to start with ensuring that technology is safe. Sorry, do you? Oh. Uh, I would like to pivot this conversation now to uh, the threat landscape that both of you see. Uh, we had chatted a little bit uh, ahead of time, and I had assumed you know, the, the two giant threats that I, I feel like I'm hearing about all the time are, are ransomware, often from Russian-related criminal groups, and a barrage of Chinese espionage. And uh, I hope you don't. This is not a breach of confidence to to say you were kind of quick to to correct me. Um, and I think I had maybe underestimated the extent to which uh, maybe China. Why don't you? I'll let you define. It. I don't want to. 
Yeah, so, you know, I've talked about kind of the two epoch-defining threats and issues that I'm concerned about. Um, one is AI. I mentioned AI because you can't have a conversation without mentioning AI. So that's done, right? Yeah, did it. Um, and then let's talk about China. Uh, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, if you look at some of the information that the U.S. government has put out over the past six months, and then you look at what is happening across the geopolitical landscape, um, I hope that people are taking seriously a pretty stark warning about the potential for uh, China to use their very formidable capabilities in the event of a conflict in the Taiwan Straits to go after our critical infrastructure. And I think we've seen a change, and frankly, you saw it in some of the products uh, that we put out earlier this year, a cybersecurity advisory that talked about uh, Chinese state-sponsored state actors living off the land, so not malware, but actually using the native processes of a computer to hide in those systems. And it wasn't for espionage or data theft, which we've been seeing arguably for decades, uh, it was more likely for disruption and destruction. And if you read the intelligence community annual threat assessment, there's a pretty stark warning that talks about in the event of a conflict, China will almost certainly consider aggressive cyber attacks against U.S. critical infrastructure and is almost certainly capable of disruption or destruction when it comes to oil and natural gas pipelines and railroads. And so I really, what we've been talking about, Kevin, is we need to take this warning very seriously. And that's why we've been talking so much, and you know, Victor Zora and I, my counterpart in Ukraine, talked to Black Hat about the importance of resilience, expecting that there will be disruption and planning and preparing for it now, identifying your high value assets, doing the exercises to be able to put in place manual overrides, manual controls, to be able to operate in a degraded state, and then ensuring that you can recover as rapidly as possible to mitigate risk. So think about Ukraine as really a shining example of not just cyber resilience, but also operational resilience, dealing with all the barbaric kinetic attacks. And then very importantly, societal resilience, which I fear we have lost as a nation. If you look at the reaction to colonial pipeline, if you look at the reaction to the high altitude balloons, um, at the end of the day, we need to be pretty pragmatic about the potential for these attacks, be prepared to meet them um, with resilience and frankly with unity as an American people. And um, I, you know, I, I think too that... <laughs> time is not our friend uh, in this quest. Um, we need to move very, very quickly. That's why uh, we've moved so quickly and so has our industry partners. I mean, you know, there's there's little, literally, we, we need to be ready now. And um, on the more we can do um, to make sure that we're not worrying um, about how ready we are. We know how ready we are um, and we know how we can manage uh, any kind of uh, attack on U.S. systems in a way that protects our ability um, to respond and in a way that protects our population um, and that allows our population to have confidence in its government and have confidence in its industry leaders that they've done everything they can to be ready for this. So preparedness is, is the name of the game here. Jen, you mentioned speaking with uh, Victor Zora, your, your counterpart in, in Ukraine, and not just in cyber, in all kinds of ways, the U.S. government has provided really substantial assistance to Ukraine, an ally being bullied by a much larger antagonistic nation to the United States. Um, there are some ways in which you can kind of map that onto China-Taiwan, but we have a more fraught diplomatic relationship with, with Taiwan. Does that impact the ability to share cyber threat information, things like that, in such a theoretical um, Yeah, I mean, it's something we're frankly thinking really hard about, and I've been really encouraged. So we signed a memorandum of cooperation with Ukraine just about a year ago, and we very purposefully put a lot of resources into um, how we could help build capacity, both in terms of um, threat hunting kits, um, how we share very detailed threat information, 
um, how we do exercises, a cyber incident response plan, um, working with other international partners like uh, the Canadians who are going to do forensic training with them. And so um, really deliberately um, putting a lot into these lines of effort. And we have gotten probably a as much out of it as the Ukrainians have because what they have learned over the past you know year and a half obviously but 10 years since Crimea I think has incredible teachings for us as we think about both capacity building with Taiwan um, which is something that I do think to your point Kevin we can map some of that um, and we certainly do share information with Taiwan cert now uh, but we would want to figure out how to help from a capacity building front um, to ensure that, the, the again, the lessons that we're learning um, with respect to Russia's aggression over Ukraine can be applied. I think it's really important. Yeah. We are nearly out of time. If you guys, oh, we have five minutes. Do you, want, do you have uh, any closing remarks, anything last uh, thing you want to share with this audience while you've got them captive? Sure. Um, my, my, my closing comment is really just thank you. Um, thank you for the welcome that we've received here um, over the last couple of days. Uh, we've had about 30 TSA people um, here and uh, really appreciate all the work that they have done um, and all the education you have provided um, to all of us. So really thank you and I look forward to continuing to develop a very good relationship um, with, with DEF CON. So thank you very much. Awesome. So thanks, Kevin, for doing this. Really appreciate it. And thanks, Dave. Dave has been in the department for a long time. You were like the vice commandant of the Coast Guard and the acting deputy secretary. And Dave, I had not been in the Department of Homeland Security. I was in DOD most of my career, and then I was in the private sector. And so Dave's kind of been my Sherpa since I got to um, DHS and has been a really great friend and, and teammate and colleague. So um, I do want to thank you for your leadership and your partnership. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, this is such a great community. This is my favorite time of the year. I love the energy. I love the community. I believe in what this community does. Um, and I really, really think we can make a difference for the nation. So um, for those who are interested in working at Team CISA, please come chat with me and my teammates. But really, come work with us because we really want to collaborate leveraging all the skills you have um, and all the skills we have for the better of the nation. So, and the last thing I'd say is I'm also doing the next talk uh, with my friend Scott Shapiro, who's a professor at Yale who wrote a great book called Fancy Bear Goes Fishing. We have renamed the talk Beers and Bears. So go get your beer and meet us back here at 530 for a great talk. Thank you.